All right. Thank you, Max. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're super excited to have you here. I'm Mary, a client relations executive from Aviation Fly, and I will be your host for today. This live webinar is presented to you by Aviation Fly together with Asia Pacific Fly Training. And we'll get to know more about these two later on because today we have lined up really amazing speakers from these organizations. For our first speaker, we have Maximilian Berger. He is the managing director of Aviation Fly, who has been helping connect airlines, pilot training organizations, and aspiring pilots across the globe. He will discuss what Aviation Fly is and give you an overview on the current state of the global aviation industry. Our second speaker, you may have heard of India, to give us a better look into their amazing school and the state of the Indian aviation industry. We also have Hemant Vishi, the Chief Executive Officer of Asia Pacific Flight Training. Now, um, from speaking with most of you aspiring pilots, we know you have been wondering, is being a pilot in India the right career choice? Uh, when is the right time to start your training? And what factors should you consider in choosing a flight school? Well, do not worry because in our short but very meaningful time together, our speakers will help us talk about and answer the most important questions you may have as aspiring pilots. Now, aside from these points, um, we'd like to remind everyone, we have a question and answer option below. You can find it in your screens and you can write down whatever questions you have throughout the webinar. So we can have our wonderful speakers answer them directly or my colleague Trisha and I can take note of these and save it for later during the question and answer portion. Now, I really hope everyone will feel comfortable in participating. Your questions are all welcome and we will try to make this as engaging and interactive as possible. All right, so to jumpstart the program, let's welcome Maximilian Berger. Thank you, Mary. Um, uh, really appreciate the very kind introduction. Um, just to begin, I kind of want to, as uh, Mary said, make this interactive. Uh, so we wanted to start off with a poll to kind of get an idea of um, who our audience is today. So we're just very quickly going to launch a poll and it would be great if um, you will see uh, the question come up, which is uh, what is your current background and uh, you can pick an answer and then we will just kind of know uh, who has joined us today and how we can um, how we can uh, uh, tailor our answers to that audience. So let's see, we have a couple of answers come in already. So we have a couple of university students. Okay, around half of the people have answered so far. So it's a really good mix so far. Okay, in the final year. Okay, Hemant, this is really interesting to see. So we have quite a few people join us today who are in their final year of, um, of uh, 12th grade in India. Okay, perfect. So we have a really good mix, um, but uh, predominantly uh, uh, people from the 12th grade in India. So thank you very much. Uh, this gives us a really good overview and we'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll launch uh, two or three more polls throughout this webinar. Uh, so for the webinar today, the agenda that we're gonna do, uh, as Sab was mentioning, is uh, first kind of what she's done already, this introduction to the panel uh, then an introduction to Aviation Fly. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the state of the global aviation industry and especially uh, how it has been impacted by the global pandemic, COVID-19. And then I'll hand it over to Hemant, uh, who is the CEO of Asia Pacific Flight Training, who will be introducing uh, the organization, uh, one of the leading flight schools in India. Uh, and he will also share some really kind of inside knowledge on the state of the Indian aviation industry because even though there's currently a global pandemic it is quite interesting to see uh, what is happening in the Indian market uh, in terms of the pilots which will be required over the next five years and the current operations of airlines and then we'll following that we'll answer some very specific questions such as will pilots be required in India 
when is the right time for an Indian aspiring pilot to start their training? And what are the top four criteria to pick a flight schools for Indian aspiring pilots? Following that, we'll do a question and answer section. Uh, but as Mary was saying, both uh, herself and Trisha are um, you know, constantly monitoring all of the questions, making note of them, potentially answering some of them already. And if not, if there's any questions which we will not answer during this webinar, we will definitely do so and uh, provide you with the answer afterwards. So what is Aviation Fly? Uh, Aviation Fly is a technology platform which uh, is mostly there to assist aspiring pilots around the world. Uh, predominantly, we focus a lot on uh, the Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa region. Um, but our whole motto is to better connect the different stakeholders in the pilot training ecosystem. So to connect aspiring pilots with pilot training organizations, to connect airlines with pilot training organizations or aspiring pilots, to just kind of bring that whole ecosystem together. And specifically for aspiring pilots, what we have built is we have built two sections, one of which is the how to become a pilot uh, guides directory, where you can find out how to become a pilot in more than 120 countries. And on the other side, we have um, most probably the largest online directory of pilot training organizations in the Asia Pacific region. So we have a website which shows uh, currently we have over 400 pilot training organizations around the world, uh, which we have on our website. And we are also specifically showing all of the different flight schools that there are in India uh, and in the region, but as far away as in the US. Um, so through that, we have a really good overview in terms of the size of the number of uh, schools that there are within each of the different countries. And we've also today invited Hemant, the CEO of Asia Pacific Flight Training, just to share more information about uh, doing your pilot training, potentially doing your pilot training, flight training in India, uh, the advantages of that, uh, and to also specifically give his uh, kind of insights and view about um, how the airline industry and how the jobs are going to be following the completion of training. Um, the reason for that is also because currently due to the global pandemic, um, there is a lot of travel restrictions. So whereas previously a large number of aspiring pilots from India used to travel to all different countries around the world to do their flight training, um, especially this year, it is quite difficult because most of the countries still have their borders shut. Uh, just to give you a very uh, brief overview of our team, uh, we're located across three different regions, Europe, Middle East and Asia. Uh, a lot of you would have most probably already spoken to either uh, uh, Mary or Trisha, who are assisting aspiring pilots for free uh, every single day to help them find a suitable um, pilot training organization. Um, so that's just a brief overview about us, but I know most of you are most probably really interested in terms of, okay, I want to become a pilot. Is it a good time? You know, is it still a good route to become a commercial pilot? And so to start off with, I just want to showcase this information, which is from Boeing, uh, which Boeing released, um, when was it? I think last year. Uh, so this, these are the numbers of how many pilots were required before COVID-19, before the global pandemic. Before COVID-19, there was so much demand for qualified airline pilots that airlines in India had to ground planes because they could not find enough qualified airline pilots to fly them. Now, due to COVID-19 and the global pandemic, of course, these numbers are uh, slightly different um, and it will all depend on how quickly the aviation industry recovers. But it is good to keep in mind that before COVID-19, the way things were going, there was a huge demand for airline pilots. 
Uh, with Asia Pacific specifically, and uh, India being uh, in the Asia Pacific region, uh, being one of the countries requiring the most uh, qualified commercial pilots. So let's look at for a moment at the current aviation industry. Because I know if you look at the news or the media, um, you know, there's a lot of negative news out there, which is absolutely right. You know, a lot of pilots are losing their job. Uh, airlines are having to reduce their size and downsize. You know, we are really fully aware of that. And it is really a challenging, challenging time for this industry. But that's not to say that uh, the aviation industry is dead or that there are no planes in the sky or that there are no pilots flying these planes. So this is just a snapshot of um, the flight activity uh, which we, uh, which we uh, took yesterday, uh, which is from a website called FlightRadar24, flightradar24.com. Uh, I highly recommend um, if anyone is interested to go and visit it. You can see all the aircraft which are currently being operated um, around the world and you can see where they're flying from, what type of aircraft they are, what speed they're going at. And so if we look at this image, we can see that there's a lot of planes in the sky. There's a lot of pilots, you know, flying these planes. And even in India, you can see quite a few aircraft once again in the sky. If you would have looked at the same picture in April or May, you would have seen very, very few uh, airlines and aircraft operating. And then if we look to the right here, this is China. So if you see in China how many aircraft are in the sky, it is, uh, it is something just to keep in mind and something which we'll touch upon in, on the next uh, slide. So looking at the global aviation industry right now, uh, due to the pandemic COVID-19, commercial air travel is down, uh, 50, uh, is currently at 55% of the level which it was last year. So it is significantly down. So essentially what this means is that compared to last year, there's around a bit more than half of all the flights operating compared to the same time last year, which is a huge number. So even if you think about it, the airlines right now at this moment in time would only need half of the amount of pilots uh, that they had last year in 2019 at the exact same time. But this data is really on a global level. And if you can see what happened here, uh, the yellow line is 2019 and the blue line is 2020. And this is the commercial flights track by Flight Radar 24. So in March, you can see this huge dip when the global lockdown started occurring. And kind of March, April was really the low point. Since then, uh, the, the global commercial air uh, commercial flights have started recovering again, but are still significantly below uh, 2019. And especially in this webinar, you know, we we don't want to say everything is great because the aviation industry is going through a challenging time. But um, what we'll touch upon later is that anyone who starts the pilot trend now is only going to get their commercial pilot license in you know one and a half to two years by which time it will be a very different uh, scenario to what we're looking at uh, for 2020. So even though airlines, for example, are letting go of a lot of pilots now, reducing their operations in 2021, 20, uh, 2022, uh, we should see uh, kind of growth again, and we'll touch upon some of the key points specifically coming out of India. On the right here, we see a graph which shows global air passenger traffic trends from 1950 to 2014. Uh, and as you can see, this is the growth of global air passengers. So even though there has been crises such as the oil shock or 9-11, September 9-11, or the global financial crisis, the aviation industry and global air passenger uh, travel has uh, just increased year on year on year, and Hemant will touch upon this a bit more. But one of the things which historically at least has proven true is that every 15 years, the people who, who, who fly via air travel doubles. Um, 
and we'll touch upon that a bit later. Um, if we go to the next slide, I wanted to kind of provide you with a bit of an overview of kind of global news headlines um, to really showcase to you some of the uh, more positive developments um, that are happening in different regions of the world. Uh, but I really want to start off uh, with the first point that in, in 2020, and most probably also for some time in 2021, the worldwide commercial airlines and the aviation industry is still adjusting to the global travel restrictions. Uh, and what I mean by uh, adjusting is in a large number of regions around the world, in Europe uh, and uh, in some parts of Asia and Australia, a lot of pilots are being let go or, or being furloughed. Um, you know, we don't, we don't want to uh, say that is not the case. That is definitely the case. And the industry is kind of adjusting to that kind of new demand. As soon as travel restrictions are lifted, as soon as there's the rollout of a vaccine, as soon as there's testing before travel, testing before boarding, we will see more of a quicker recovery in the air travel. And it's very interesting to note that anyone who thinks about becoming a commercial pilot once again has to keep in mind that it's not about where the industry is at right now. It is where is the industry going to be in one and a half years? What are the jobs going to be like in one and a half years? But even right now, globally, airlines are and the aviation industry is adjusting to the pandemic, but there's plenty of positive news which gives an indication of where the aviation industry might be heading. So these are all news from the past uh, three weeks. Uh, so for example, the South China Morning Post, uh, uh, and we, we can share all these articles later, wrote that China's domestic air traffic, air traffic volume is expected to reach a record high during the upcoming Golden Holy Week holiday, which is next week or the week after. And BBC as well, coronavirus flights within China to fully recover next month. They uh, wrote that in the last week of August. Um, if we look at the data, commercial air travel in China for domestic travel is already fully back to 2019 levels. So even though uh, uh, China started the pandemic earliest, or you know they were the first ones to uh, kind of see COVID-19, they've also somehow been the first ones to come out of it. And air travel and the airlines have bounced right back. So in China in itself, you know, the airlines are continuing to grow uh, for the domestic routes and they will need more pilots. If we look at the US, um, we know that around the world, uh, in certain regions, airlines are letting go of a lot of pilots, but at the same time, uh, cargo operators, so uh, kind of uh, operators which do air cargo, are uh, currently expanding because there's a lot of demand for cargo to be um, shipped via air. So cargo operators are hiring as well private jet operators. So uh, around the world, um, there's a number of really large uh, private jet operators, one of them being NetJets, which is currently hiring a lot of pilots. Yes, it is not, um, you know, it is not a kind of an airline pilot job or the airlines are not hiring as much right now, but there's plenty of other jobs in this industry where there is some operators and there is some companies uh, hiring. And especially anyone who is thinking about starting their pilot training should always also think that, you know, most people think, okay, there's the route, I wanna become, you know, an airline captain. But there's a lot of other different jobs as well in the aviation industry, uh, specifically for pilots in general aviation, um, with private jets and cargo, air ambulance. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, when thinking about, you know, doing your training and will there be jobs uh, post training. Um, some of you might know uh, Emirates, Emirates Airlines. Uh, so I've included it here because I'm currently located in uh, the UAE in Dubai. So Emirates also had uh, let go of a lot of pilots and is still adjusting the whole infrastructure to the global pandemic. But at the same time, they've just announced that from October onwards, they will start 
paying full salaries again. So once again, that's kind of a good sign that we're starting to see some sort of recovery in um, the airline industry in certain regions. And I know, you know, this uh, webinar is specifically focused for uh, aspiring pilots from India. So I've included a couple of points uh, for the Indian market, uh, which are all uh, fairly recent news headlines before I hand over to Hemant. And um, the first thing really is uh, the CEO of Indigo, uh, which has, you know, uh, said publicly that um, they expect to be operating at 75% of their capacity again by early 2021, which is not too far away if you think about it. And then also, if you look at the his statements and his interviews, their target is to be back at 100% of operation by the end of 2021, which is still uh, long before anyone who would start their pilot training now completes their commercial uh, pilot license. Uh, another CEO, which most probably most of you know, which has just said that quite uh, recently, is Vistara, which, uh, where the CEO has said that there will be no layoffs uh, and it will just be salary cuts, which will be reviewed in 2021. And I'm sure also Hemant can give more kind of overview in terms of the, the hiring and the strategy of the Indian Airlines. Um, but it's important to, to, to keep note of these two points. Um, the last point is really one from uh, Asia, uh, from Airbus, sorry, uh, the aircraft manufacturer Airbus, which is that Airbus um, has previously said, and this was from the Economic Times of India, that Airbus will deliver one new aircraft on average per week to airlines in India over the next 10 years. So once again, this was before COVID-19 and before the global pandemic. But if we were just to take that assumption, we can calculate how many new pilots are required in India. And uh, uh, later on in the presentation, we will uh, back up this, uh, uh, this point by Airbus and by the Indian uh, airline CEOs by something which the civil aviation minister has just said as recently as last week. Uh, but for the time being, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it over uh, to Hemant just to give a bit of an introduction to uh, Asia Pacific flight training and to talk more about um, the global, uh, uh, the Indian aviation training industry. So Hemant, over to you. Uh, thanks, Max. Uh, I hope uh, you all can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, good afternoon, folks, uh, uh, who was uh, joined from all over. Uh, that's a good uh, background on the global scenario that uh, Ma Max gave us. Now, the point is that uh, everyone wants to know one thing. Everybody knows aviation is, uh, is a major industry, which is a growing industry, is a sunrise industry, but uh, it's also supposed to be expensive and it's difficult to get into, and would you be able to get a job and do justice if you spend all that money, which is a natural question for everyone to ask. Uh, so what we are here to do is <clears throat> answer that question to our best of our abilities, and if you have anything left, you can always text us messages or write to us. And the second thing is to see what are the prospects immediately and in the coming future. Now towards that, uh, like Max mentioned that, uh, where we're called the Asia Pacific Flight Training uh, 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 Academy Limited, uh, based out of uh, Shamshabad, the Rajiv Gandhi International Airport, Hyderabad, and we have a second operating base at Begum Pet Airport. We fly uh, Diamond Aircraft, uh, which is the latest state of the art carbon fiber body uh, airplanes. Uh, for those who don't know what's carbon fiber, you know, the famous 787 Dreamliner. Uh, which one of my friends, uh, uh, Captain Sanjay Bharatwaj, is, uh, uh, flies uh, for an Air India and probably is on the webinar anyway. So this is uh, considered the most modern uh, airframe, and that's the one which is used by Diamond Airplanes and the only flight training uh, planes that use them. Reason being, it is uh, light and it is uh, durable. So we have been in business for about seven, eight years, and uh, we fly out of this uh, airspace, which is one of the busiest airspace. We got about 550 
uh, air traffic movements a day out of uh, Shamshabad, the Rajiv Gandhi Airport, as well as another about 100 to 200 out of Begum Pit. So it's a fairly busy airspace that makes our pilots also, uh, you know, very, very uh, apt at handling airplanes in a busy international airspace, the radio telephony, etc. Now coming to uh, our uh, 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 scenario here, uh, we, I'll go uh, with, the, uh, with the general uh, uh, industry scenario first before coming to anything else. Now, Indian industry, as uh, Max uh, mentioned, is currently supposed to be the seventh largest industry in the world. Now, we are supposed to be flying pre-COVID uh, just slightly under 300 million uh, um, passengers a year. Now, 200 to 300 million, uh, if you count uh, domestic, you count both ways and international. Now, if you look at it, you might think that India, uh, being a country of 1.2 billion people, uh, we might be flying 20 to 25% uh, of the population. Uh, well, that's not true because, uh, you know, last year I took about 120 flights and I'm sure people like Max and uh, a lot of us, we fly every week or every second week. So we are counted. So I took over 120 flights. So I'm counted as 120 passengers, whereas I'm actually only one. So if you take unique flyers, we only have barely six to 7% of India's population flying. Now six to 7% is an abysmally low figure, which means over 90% Indians do not fly by airline. Okay. So that is not a very good statistic and is definitely doesn't reflect the potential of the country. It doesn't mean that 90% Indians cannot afford to fly, not at all. Matter of fact, there is another survey which says 250 million passengers, that's about 100 million families, if you take two or two and a half persons uh, per family, uh, 150 uh, million families can afford one trip a day, uh, one trip a year, you know, for uh, visiting friends, relatives, etc. And an average uh, flight ticket, if you book well in advance, cost you three to 4,000 rupees, which is same or actually lower than a Rajdhani or a second class AC or a first class AC train ticket, which also you have to book six months in advance. And we all know it's not easy to travel by train in India. It takes two to three days, long distance. You need to eat six meals a day from a railway canteen, which is not known for his, uh, you know, food hygiene and then crowded platforms and dirty toilets and all that stuff. So if somebody were to pay three to 4,000 rupees upfront, uh, and if you book uh, six months in advance, you'll get a flight ticket for 2,000 also. You can fly once a year to your hometown or on a holiday, etc. That will add another 150 to 200 million passengers a year. That's the size of an entire Europe's market for the entire year. That's the power of Indian aviation. And that, why is it not started yet? because 60 to 70% of our current flyers come from only Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, Calcutta, and Kochi. We all know that 60 to 70% of the population doesn't live in only these seven cities. Our population is spread all over the country. But because of reach, frequencies, connectivity, most people beyond these six, seven metros, only 30% contribution comes from the rest of the country. Whereas population wise, nearly 80% stays in those countries, uh, in those uh, cities. Now, if you try to travel, like there was a recent example given from Gulbarga to Bangalore, they have to drive two to three hours by road to Hyderabad. Then again, catch a plane to Hyderabad, uh, sorry, to Bangalore. And from there, if you want to go to a surrounding village, another three to four hours. So you talked about 12 to 13 hours by this much time, you could have reached beyond Europe halfway through to America. Now, there is a tremendous national waste when you sit in a train or a bus for 12 hours, 14 hours, whereas a plane can take you in one or two hours. Money lost, uh, health hazard due to COVID and other stuff. And also it affects the growth of the economy. So India is a market which is primed for this explosion. So what has stopped it from growing so far? Well, nothing has stopped it. Uh, 2018, now before this role, I was the executive vice president and CEO at Hyderabad the International Airport. 41 months in a row, India grew at double digit, over 10%. Now, this is unprecedented and the civilization secretary said is the highest growth recorded in the world. 
but that all that growth has netted us only 7% of the entire population okay even if another 2 to 3% fly that means we will double from 7 to 10 that is how exponentially the indian market is expected to grow and one of the steps that the government has taken is to expand more airports beyond these seven airports to smaller cities you might have heard of the scheme called udan udega desh ka amnagari okay which basically uh, translates to uh, you know every citizen in the country will fly and it's also called the rcs scheme regional connectivity scheme now these will reach smaller towns like i mentioned gulbarga karnool uh, you know rajamundri all these places smaller towns you know up north uh, uh, beyond uh, ludhiana chandigarh jalandhar you know all of these uh, smaller markets it will have plane connectivity today if you want to go from delhi to aligarh you have to fly 3 4 hours if you want to go to a uh, you know another city uh, in up or rajasthan or wherever you drive 6 8 hours 10 hours you know indian roads are, some of the roads are not very good and it takes a lot of time it's also risky whereas a plane can get you there in about 1000 to less than 2000 rupees and that's the cost of a deluxe a volvo bus or a whatever and it will get you there in 50 minutes flat in nice hygienic condition why will people not fly so that is why the government is committed to opening these airports and they have launched this rcs regional connectivity scheme where airlines are incentivized to fly to these smaller planes uh, smaller airports and they will be using to start with aircraft like uh, atr or a q400 so this is what is expected to boost india's growth and that if you go to the next slide will show we are expected to uh, reach number 3 slot by about 2025 26 plus or minus covid you add another year or so from the second uh, from the seventh largest to the second largest uh, one very interesting data here is before covid we had 650 about 690 airplanes in india that includes all uh, you know uh, vistara air asia air india through jet and all of them put together 650 aeroplanes correspondingly the second largest player in the country, uh, in the world currently which is china has close to 6900 or 7000 aeroplanes the difference is 10 times more everybody knows that we are not 10 times smaller than china or we are not 10 times smaller as an economy as a population as the size of the country Okay, we are the seventh largest country in the world. We are 3.3 million square kilometers. China, I think, is around fourth or fifth largest. Population-wise, you know that uh, we are uh, almost close to China. Uh, we are the second uh, uh, most populated, and China is the most populated. Economy-wise, maybe they're around four or five times bigger than us, but not 10 times. Aviation is 10 times. So this aviation market can be compared to what mobile phone market was in 1990s, when most of you were not born or about being born, you ask your parents, they'll tell you that 1990s, one colony in India had one telephone. You had to go to your you know, good friend in your neighbor to make one phone call. Or people used to go to an STD booth after 10 o'clock in the night because you get a phone call which is cheaper. That was the way uh, thing used to work. And today you all know that, forget every colony, every individual has one phone, they have two phones, the auto driver has a phone, uh, the, the cleaner has a phone, even the beggar on the road has a phone. Okay, and he's got a smartphone. So from one of the lowest tele-density countries in the world, we are now the world's second largest tele-density market in the world after China. So aviation is poised for such an explosive growth. And by the way, there are similar stories like this in automobile. 1980s, only Ambassador Fiat, if you see the old movies of, you know, uh, Devanand and all, I mean, you'll see only uh, Ambassador and Fiat. And today, uh, I've lost count how many cars we have in the, uh, in the country. And uh, everybody owns a car. Same thing with television and fridge. I remember while growing up, going to a neighbor's house to watch an important movie or uh, watch a cricket match. And when some guest came, we had to go and, uh, you know, borrow ice from a neighbor because we didn't have a fridge. Now, today, I think there is a TV and a fridge in every room. So similarly, aviation is one of the last markets which India has yet to attack and we are about to attack. Now coming to the current scenario, COVID has obviously depressed uh, the uh, traffic everywhere. Uh, Max already touched upon it and 
surely India is also impacted. But that's natural, that happened. Okay, we are done and dusted. We started in 25th of March, I think we started flying. Okay. Uh, uh, 25th of March, we started flying. And uh, we are, we started with about 10 odd thousand uh, uh, passengers a day. To last week or so, we have got about 130 uh, thousand passengers a day traveling. That's one lakh thirty thousand people a day traveling. Okay, that is a massive change from the first day till uh, last week, and it is growing uh, day by day. Uh, I was traveling like since COVID, and and a lot of people are scared, and business travelers are not traveling uh, since COVID uh, lockdown opened uh, early June till today, folks. Guess how many flights I have taken? I've taken 33rd flight yesterday, 33. So I'm single-handedly trying to improve Indian aviation. You all need to fly too. Okay. And it's absolutely safe, clinically clean airports, clinically clean aircraft. Uh, you know, people wear masks and, you know, uh, everything. So it's perfectly all right. And now government has approved opening of 60% of the slots. So it is growing. And the interesting factor is most passengers who are currently traveling are all, this growth has come from all families. They're all VFR, what we call visiting friends and relatives, which means these people used to travel by train. Like I said, Rajdhani, Shatabdi, second AC, first AC, etc. Okay. And now they're traveling by plane. So uh, that is why I'm saying it's uh, the, the growth is good. And when, Finally, business travelers return and these families which are traveling already in the plane, they will stay back. They'll not go back to train. Once you've already flown in the aeroplane and you see the ticket is comparable and it is much more safer, faster, cleaner. And especially now with the health consciousness in India, they will stay back and they will be permanent flyers. And so when the business travelers come back, this uh, traffic that we gained of families in the country will be actually a gain. Now coming to some statistics, which is on the slide. So we have about 650 and China has 10 times and US don't even ask me. It's over 10,000 aeroplanes, commercial carriers. Other than the 650, we also have a two, 300, what is called as general aviation. General aviation is private aeroplanes of industrialists like Tata or GMR or whatever, uh, or, or uh, uh, corporate jets, as well as uh, uh, what we call as NSOPs, non schedule operator permit, which is uh, your chartered aeroplanes. Then of course, there is the flight training uh, aeroplane. So we have about 180 flight training aeroplanes. So all put together, we are talking thousand aeroplanes and China, again, comparison, general aviation itself is around four to 5,000. So we are way, way behind the others. So one is to 10 is the ratio and we are catching up fast. Now, pre COVID, we had over thousand aeroplanes. This is for those people who are wanting to be a pilot and wondering, is there an opportunity? Take a look at the numbers and you can decide on your own. Pre-COVID, we had over 1,100 aeroplanes on order. An aircraft to operate from six in the morning to 10 in the night, you require 14 pilots per aircraft. That's about seven sets. That's because there is something called as an FTDL, flight duty time limit, that a pilot cannot work for more than eight hours a day and the seventh day has to be off. So to cater to that and then the privileged leave, sick leave, holidays, deep hourly, holy, all that stuff, you need 14 pilots per aircraft. So for 1,000 aeroplanes, you need 14,000 pilots. Now that's over the next five years. Now yesterday, or was a day before, 21st, I think, uh, Mr. Puri, uh, uh, the uh, aviation minister, mentioned that 9,458 pilots are required in the next uh, uh, five years. So that's not far off from my mark, 9,488 pilots. Uh, Mary, we can go back to that slide. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. So, uh, so 9,500, 10,000 doesn't matter. 10,000 pilots in five years means you need approximately 2,000 pilots a year. And how many pilots do you think India is producing per year in the country? You'll be amazed. It's a mere 350 to 400 pilots we are producing in the country. So by that standard, to get 10,000 pilots, how many years do we need? 
we need 10 years we can't do that more than 10 years okay so uh, we cannot uh, 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 sorry i'm uh, uh, it, it's uh, 20 years right yeah okay nearly 20 years you need so it's a ridiculous number you can't wait for 20 years you know uh, uh, to produce the pilot that is required today so pilot shortage was already the case in india before the covid happened indigo published in the newspaper somewhere the article came late 2019 early 2020 that they were cancelling 32 flights a day due to shortage of pilots when i was the chief commercial officer at gmr airport i had one airline coming and telling me that they want a parking from eight o'clock in the evening upwards so i told them why do you want to park at eight o'clock why don't you do two three more flights and fly till 11 o'clock they said that uh, we would love to but we don't have pilots now this is a big airline then a smaller airline operating uh, atr came to me and said that they want parking slot at the airport from 16:30 that's 4:30 in the evening i said are you kidding me i said 4:30 is like half the day is left and you block one parking you know it also uh, uh, prevents other airplanes from coming and going and they said sorry we would like to fly more but we don't have enough pilots so that is between and and per day they were losing around six to seven uh, sorties. Uh, if you take an average rotation of eight to ten uh, rotations for an ATR, they were doing just about five, six of them. So about three to four there, and Indigo around 32. So between these two airlines, around 40, 50 uh, flights were being cancelled per day due to shortage of pilots. Now, one flight, a 737 or a 320, folks, can earn you up to 10 lakh rupees. Okay, so if the flight is full, Average ticket, three, four, five thousand rupees. It costs, it, 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 the revenue is about 10 lakh. Now, if you cancel 30 flights, that is three crores of revenue you lose in a day. That is 990 crores a year, a thousand crores a year. For those folks who are not used to crores and uh, this thing, that is about uh, 150 million dollars you lose by canceling you know, just 30 flights a day. That is not something that the airlines want to do. So when you are in such a short supply and COVID of course dampened it, but when it comes back to start with, we were not catering the full pilot market anyway. So when you come back, you will hit the peak within the six to eight months, like Indigo, Indigo uh, CEO uh, Rano Joedatta mentioned. Uh, you know, early 2021, they'll hit 75% capacity. They're already doing around 30 to 40%. And mid to late next year, it'll be back to full capacity. When you go to full capacity, what happens? Exactly what happened last year when we were at full capacity. You will cancel 30, 40 flights a day due to shortage of pilots. So that is why smart airlines, Indigo, Vistara, all of these people are continuing with their cadet pilot program. They are continuing to recruit people and say, that a pilot takes at least one and a half to two years to train, including type training, examination, passing, interview, group discussion. The whole thing takes about two years to get a pilot ready. So they better start today. So 2020, middle or end you start, you will be ready by 2022 or 21 end. So that by 21 end, when the thing comes back to peak, again, you are not canceling flight and losing revenue because of shortage of pilots. Hence, the, it's not surprising that Indigo or Vistara, none of them, they have uh, retrenched about 15% of their team members, but none of them are pilots, if you notice. Not a single pilot from Indigo or Vistara has been uh, uh, retrenched because they know with what great difficulty they got them, they're not going to let them go. Some of them might not be flying now, or their rosters might be reduced, because of obviously there is restriction from the government not to fly, not anybody else. And some of the largest states like Maharashtra uh, and uh, West Bengal and uh, Tamil Nadu, etc. still have not opened up full flights. So it's natural. Uh, you know, this was an unknown, unheard of pandemic, which none of us were prepared for. Okay. So airlines are uh, in a similar fashion. They were not also uh, returned, uh, ready for it. Hence, you know, the numbers went down. But... That's, that's a temporary dip. Nobody wanted to fly. Should, nobody should have flown in the last three, four months because we didn't want the disease to spread. 
Now, you know, over a period of time, business will return to normal. The new normal, as people say, they will wear masks and shields and all the sanitizers and all the jazz. And, you know, they'll go to work. I mean, work can't stop. Like I said, I've already taken 32 flights. It's only a matter of time before others do the same. Okay. Hence, the pilot demand will pick up much, much faster. And it being such a technically difficult uh, uh, profession to master and uh, create overnight, you know, you could do IT training or uh, management training or any other training uh, in a crash course. You could do, you know, daily classes. You could do night classes. You could do weekend classes, extra classes. Can't do that for pilot training. They have to follow a certain curriculum. They have to sleep so many hours a day and so on and so forth. Hence, all major airlines, not just here, I've been in touch with some foreign FTOs. They are taking intakes. US is doing a robust intake because they know that they need those pilots two years from now. So all those aspiring pilots who join today will finish the training in 2021 or early 2022. Now, how many of us believe that by 2021 end or 2022 beginning in another one, one and a half year, the crisis would not be over? I don't think any of us believe that the crisis won't be over because if it is not over by then, we have a much bigger problem. Forget about flying or aviation or anything. Okay. So there's nothing to worry. This matter of fact is the right time to join because the trainings are available. Slots are available. And by the way, in the middle of all the problem with the, with all the COVID and the problem, we already recruited one batch. Okay. By the last month. And that's within two months of us opening after COVID. So it's not that uh, 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 people are not uh, wanting to train. They're wanting to train and they want to train. And now from the government side, government has decided to open up 22 new airports for flight training alone to speed up the flight training. Because in India, some places flight training used to take a long time because of lack of airport, lack of uh, 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 enough airspace. So 22 airports are being released in the next six months. And we're also importing more aeroplanes as a result. The idea is to not only finish the flight training within 18 to uh, or 24 months, we want to get it down to 52 weeks, which is one year. Okay. We can do that. We have the capability, both the pilots as well as the, uh, uh, this thing. So that is as far as training and capability and uh, the potential of the market is concerned. Now, if you go say, okay, what do we do and how do you go about it and uh, uh, how do you choose a, a you know, flight training uh, school? Hemant, so first and foremost, basic, sorry. Yeah, Hemant, can I just, um, so you touched upon this point about when is the right time to start a pilot training. What we've done is we've created a poll uh, just for the audience. Uh, which is when are you wanting to start your pilot training? So we'll just launch this poll very quickly to get an idea of when everyone uh, ideally uh, is thinking about, you know, starting their pilot training. So I'm just launching this poll now. Um, you should see a question pop up. And then um, uh, you can pick one of the answers. So the different, you know, are you looking to start your pilot training in 2020, in the first half of 2021, in the second half of 2021, or in 2022, or in 2023? So just, you know, share with us your, your, um, your answers. These are all anonymous. And um, it would be really interesting to kind of get an, get an idea of what people are thinking of when they want to start um, their training. So we'll just uh, leave the poll go on for a bit more. We can already see the results come in. And actually quite surprising is that so far, actually three people are looking at 2020 this year. Um, and then uh, we have uh, a few people next year, but also people in 2022 and 2023. Um, so really, really interesting. Um, Okay, we'll just end the poll here, uh, unless there's a let few it, more of you. Yeah. Why don't you let it carry on for a while? Let them, let them write okay. for a while. Then. Okay, uh, while we let the poll continue, um, really thank you, Hemant, for this uh, insight on the Indian market and, you know, the potential of the Indian market, which 
any you know uh, anyone can see through any of the reports through the population size that there's huge potential in terms of um, uh, the Indian aviation market post the pandemic or even when there is the pandemic. I just wanted to also share with everyone, um, you know, there's a number of vaccines which are in development uh, by countries such as China, Russia, uh, the UK, the US. Uh, India is actually one of the leading producers of uh, one of the potential medicines uh, for COVID-19, uh, hydrochloroquine. And um, and, and, and while all of that is going on, there's also a lot of development for quicker tests, quicker COVID tests. And uh, currently around Europe, um, there's actually tests which are being deployed so that when people come and check in for their flight, they will just gargle like mouthwash uh, a certain fluid, spit it back into the tube. And within a short period of time, uh, that test can give the result on if a person uh, uh, should get a PCR test for COVID-19. So all of these developments are also taking place at the same time, which will once again boost uh, 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 the aviation industry in a return of more air travelers who will feel safer, you know, uh, traveling uh, via air. Um, so, okay, so we've got uh, 12 answers uh, for this poll where three have been looking to start in 2020, uh, two in 2021, another two in, 22, uh, uh, two in 2022, and uh, a very large number in 2023. So the, uh, we must have quite a few people who are, you know, uh, looking, at, uh, looking at this long term. Uh, we just want to quickly launch another poll um, to, to see what the audience is thinking, which is, uh, where are you planning on doing your pilot training? So this is a multiple choice. Uh, so you can uh, select a number of different options. Um, there's India, there's the US, there's Canada, New Zealand, Europe, or other countries. So once again, uh, it would be great uh, to kind of give your thought process of ideally where you are looking to, uh, where your preferred location would be or where you're looking to, to do your flight training. Um, if you are uh, picking other countries, it would be great if you can put it in the chat uh, to, to kind of say what uh, your preference is in terms of what you're thinking of where you want to do uh, your flight training. Uh, so until now, it's pretty much the majority of people really uh, picking India, which is something which we'll touch upon uh, in a moment. Uh, you know, uh, there's really uh, a lot of advantages of doing your pilot training in India, especially now with travel restrictions. And then Hemant will later also touch upon some of the conversion processes that one has to do if uh, you do your pilot training uh, in another country. Um, so interesting, uh, but there's a clear preference for India uh, and someone has also expressed interest in the US and a number of people for other countries. So it would be really good if, uh, if for the other countries, if you can just drop in the chat kind of where you're thinking of, of, uh, of wanting to do your pilot training. Uh, we have one final poll, which is, um, what is your current hesitation to start your pilot training? Once again, this is multiple choice. I'll just launch it now. So the different options are, and you can pick a number of different options. Uh, uncertainty about there being a pilot job after you finish training and getting your commercial pilot license. Uh, another option is COVID-19 travel restrictions, uh, COVID-19 health precautions. So are people worried about, you know, is it going to be safe to do your pilot training? Uh, another option is not enough funds to start pilot training. Uh, and uh, another option would be unsure about uh, which school, uh, which pilot training organization to pick. So um, you can pick a number of them. You don't have to pick one. You can select a number of them. It would be really good to see kind of what people are, uh, what the audience is currently thinking in terms of, um, you know, what, what the different um, what the different thoughts are. So I can already see that 
Uh, there are some people which have uh, selected COVID-19 health uh, precautions. So really asking the question, you know, is it safe to do your pilot training right now? And that's certainly something which uh, uh, later uh, Hemant can kind of give a bit of an overview of. Uh, there's a number of things which uh, pilot training organizations have implemented to make pilot training really as safe as possible. Um, there's been a number of people which have also selected not enough funds to start pilot training. Hemant can also later touch upon uh, about some potential solutions that they have. Uh, and then there's also the uncertainty about a pilot job, uh, which is really something which we wanted to stress today. Uh, so that while globally so many pilots are losing their jobs, um, in India and it's uh, in India itself, if we look at the big airlines, yes, they have done really large salary cuts uh, to kind of survive this pandemic and this lower travel demand. But at the same time, Indigo or Vistara have not really let go of pilots because they know how difficult it is to get those pilots again uh, post the pandemic. And they know that anyone who starts their pilot training right now will only be ready to fly with a commercial airline in uh, you know, 2021 or maybe 2022. Uh, so thank you everyone uh, for, for sharing uh, these thoughts with us. Um, so maybe what, what we'll do at this point here is we'll just move ahead one slide here. Let me just move this up, um, which is really kind of this point which Hemant has addressed uh, earlier. Uh, apologies for that, let me just move this. Uh, which is, will pilots be required in India? And actually the most, um, the really the, the key headline that has come out a few days ago was the Civil Aviation Minister of India, Hardeep Singh Puri, saying that uh, 9,488 new pilots will be required in the next five years. And he said that on the 21st of September, uh, 2020. Um, so if we move ahead, which is, uh, uh, Hemant, maybe you would be a good person to answer this question. When is the right time for an Indian aspiring pilot to start their training? All right, uh, thanks. Uh, hope you can hear us. And uh, the uh, first and foremost, like uh, for pilots to start training in India, they need to pass their 12 standard exam and they need to have physics and mathematics as a subject. And in case they do not have physics and mathematics, uh, let's say they are commerce, stream or arts, they can still do pilot training by appearing for these two exams from an open school on the side, a supplementary examination, and they can qualify. Uh, and someone also asked on the chat, I think that, uh, do you need uh, physics and maths even if you do pilot training abroad? Well, Wherever you do pilot training, if you come to India to convert the license, you need to have these subjects. So if you want to fly in Indian skies, as per DGCA, these subjects are mandatory for an Indian pilot to fly. Hence, it's better that you do it. And if you're going to pass the CPL exam, it's the same level as your 10th and 12th standard maths and physics basics. So you do that. So that is one aspect. So 10th, so you pass 12th standard with physics and maths and you're eligible now. Now, then you need to get your police verification done, medicals done, and you know the paperwork uh, clarified. And then you start around four to six months of ground training and about 12 to 14 months of flying training. So overall 18 to 20 months, depending on weather, of course, is the only unpredictable thing. Like last year, we lost around good four to six months of uh, to bad weather because this area had the highest recorded rainfall in 100 years. That cannot be uh, controlled. But other than that, it's about 18 months average. Then it takes you another six odd months to do type training. Okay, depending on whether you want to go for Airbus or Boeing or whatever. Then the airline uh, interview process, that itself can take three months, six months. So you will be employed at let's say about two to two and a half years from the time that you start pilot training. So if you're sitting in 2020 September, that means already the earliest you can be employed is 2022 September or 2023 early. So if you do not want to be employed beyond this, then this today is the day to start flight training. Because if you start today, it'll take you earliest by 2023 to be employed and start earning a salary. Any more delay, 
will only further delay it. I told you pre-COVID, uh, uh, we were having a shortage of pilots and we were producing only 350 pilots a year, 400 pilots, and there was a queue, there was a backlog. We did not hire a new batch for close to one and a half year because of we had so much backlog that we did not take any fresh pilots. We had people calling us, calling our board of directors, uh, calls coming through ministry saying, please take my son, take my daughter. And we said, look, we are full. We cannot take any more. So close to one and a half year, we did not take any, any pilots. That was the abundance or shortage of uh, slots in the flight training industry. Then we started taking pilots last year. And now they are under training and they'll pass out uh, late next year or, uh, uh, you know, before that. So today, if you start, you will be ready by 23. Now, if you delay it, unless you are in 10th or 11th standard and you will pass your exam only a year or two later, that's understandable. But if you're ready and do not fly today, flight training is going to get much more expensive and is going to, the slots are going to be much more tighter as time goes by. It's simple as anything else. But Hemant, You're saying something Max? Yeah, let me ask you because this is, I think, the question which is which we saw in the poll as well. You know, um, now is a good time to start your pilot training. But can you just share with everyone why it is also safe to start your pilot training right now? Because I'm sure there will be a lot of people worried about, you know, uh, COVID-19 and the global pandemic. So can you just share a bit about why it is also safe to start your training? All right, good point. Uh, like I said, uh, first of all, if you're going to come into aviation, you're going to be a brave soul, all right? You're going to take an aeroplane and fly up in the sky. So I'm sure you're in the brave category already. So like I said, for the third time now that I've taken 30, 32 flights, it's absolutely safe because you need to take certain precautions. You need to wear your gloves, masks, your sanitizers and stuff. What we are doing in the Flight Training Academy, by the way, all our cadets have reported back after the COVID, and, uh, uh, you know, they're wearing their masks, their uh, PPE suits, gloves, and we are sanitizing the aircraft. We are cleaning it after every uh, uh, usage. Okay, even the officers, we have a very large uh, 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 airport uh, and uh, enough facilities there. And when we roster people, we do not roster like a bunch of people uh, 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 for a certain sortie. We only roster based on the uh, uh, requirement of the day. So hence, uh, there is, in, in terms of safety in flying, if ever there is anything, it is flight training. Schools and colleges are closed because in a class you have 30, 40, 60 students and there are 20 classes, 30 classes going on together, section A, B, C, D, and first to 12th, that's around 60, 70 sections running with 30 to 40 students. Okay, that's around two to two and a half thousand to 3,000 people uh, uh, flying. Uh, sorry, uh, flying in our, uh, 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 sorry, two, two to 3,000 people studying in a, a medium to large school. But in a flight training, we, per aeroplane is two people wearing a suit and all that stuff. And per, uh, you know, on the ground, there are just about three to four people, engineers, marshalers, etc. So there is an airport runway and the apron is a very, very large area. There is no crowding. People have to have a Bureau of Civil Aviation Security pass to enter it. So only necessary people can only come inside. And as a result, okay, um, yeah. And most important thing about the flight training is, unlike a school, it is not mass training. It is one-on-one -on -one training. Okay, one pilot, one instructor at a time. Now, if both of them are wearing masks, they are sitting apart or they are sitting in an airplane, by the way, the wind speed in an aeroplane is 140 knots. It's about 200, 250 kilometers an hour. The wind passes through the cockpit. There is no question of cross-contamination because whatever is there in the air flies out very fast. It's sucked out very fast. So it is physically very safe. And we have taken multiple precautions such as, like I said, gloves, masks, sanitizers, etc. So touch wood, you know, uh, all flight training schools are operational at full speed. So there is no problem about safety. Okay, safe, same as for passengers, as well as for trainees. Okay. Now, and, and Hamid, yeah, also on. another yeah. question on this poll, because there's a number of people which have said, 
they would be interested to look at 2020 to start their training. And um, that, now that we've also addressed the points of of uh, safety, there's one point which, you know, we always get asked, like Trisha and uh, Mary always answer this question, uh, which is that we all know that pilot training is is quite expensive. Uh, you know, it is it is really not, uh, unfortunately, it is not really uh, available to everyone. Uh, I know that Asia Pacific Flight Training has um, really worked on kind of making it more accessible to a larger number of people. So I was wondering if maybe you could just share uh, kind of the unique feature that Asia Pacific Flight Training in Hyderabad has on offer uh, for people who want to become a pilot and who want to start their flight training with them. Sure. Uh, matter of fact, it's a very pertinent and important question that you asked. Thanks for reminding. And I noticed on the chat, some people said that they're waiting for lack of funds. Yes, it costs you about, including type training and flight training, close to about 50 to 60 lakh rupees, which is uh, in dollar terms about, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, about 60 to 70 thousand dollars total. Uh, you know, to be sitting on the right seat of the pilot, including the airline charges and all that. Now that to most families in India, that looks like a big amount and it is a big amount. It was for all of us. Okay. Now what we need to see is that we have organized a, a loan facility through Axis Bank. It's there on our website and uh, based on the parents income, based on some collateral, maybe the house they have, or they're working in a government job or a private job, whatever the criteria is the bank, they give a loan for the entire amount up to 90%, up to 95% then you can also choose the repayment option after finishing the training so during training when you're not earning you don't need to pay the repayment so your parents are not burdened so two to three years you can take a moratorium and the loan can be five years seven years or whatever it is now please understand a carrot gets ready to start training at the age of 17 or 18. we have a 17 year old girl training we had a 16 year old girl joining us, you know, uh, because just before uh, 12 and you have to be 18 at the time of submission of license to DGC. Now at you start uh, uh, training at about 17, 18, it takes you, let's say two years to get on the right seat of a uh, airline, you know, after your flight training, your uh, type training and your uh, medicals and airline selection process interview, all that stuff. So you start at 17 or 18, at 19 to 20, you have become a first officer. A first officer, pre-COVID salaries, and there has been a salary curtailment, but that's only temporary because the revenue is less, so the salary is less. When you come back to full level, already the major airlines have said that they will revise the salary in January to June timeframe uh, because uh, even the revenue comes back. When you get recruited, when you start as a first officer and you have been released as a first officer within about a year of joining your salary can be up to 36 lakhs per annum 36 lakhs in dollars is uh, uh okay about fifty thousand dollars per annum okay so i told you that it cost you about 70 80 000, 70 thousand dollars to do the training or 50 to 60 lakh and your first year's earning is 36 lakh. Tell me how many jobs in the country at the age of 19 or 20 can get a salary of 36 lakh rupees. Most parents who come to us and say, my daughter's starting salary in an airline was higher than my retirement salary. That is the case. So with 36 lakh rupees salary, in two to three years time, people pay off the loan. Okay, so though it looks high, but for a middle class family, you take a loan, you take a moratorium for two years so that your parents don't have to pay the EMIs. In two odd years, you get into the play, you get into the training, uh, you get into the airline, okay? And in two to three years' time, after that, after starting the employment, you pay off the loan. So it is very much reachable to Indians. And we are also now trying to get more and more banks involved and even private. Uh, funders to come and support uh, uh, prospective uh, pilots because we are very clear we don't want only the rich people to you know be pilots we want people like us from a background like ours i mean uh, i i've told this in the past too 
that I also, you know, could not afford it. I, I grew up in a very small village, uh, you know, uh, I studied there and uh, forget about aeroplanes, we hardly had any cars there. So I also aspired to be something, but I could not do that. And consequently, uh, you know, uh, later on, uh, I, I can't, what is it? Yeah. And also government has started the Skill India Initiative where they want Indian youngsters to be uh, trained. And there are uh, National Skill Development Council, etc., which is funding uh, people from poorer backgrounds to do this. Each state government has a aviation uh, department and they have budgets to train people in aviation, including giving uh, subsidies or full fee. Matter of fact, over the last couple of years, we have had state government funded students whose entire fee has been taken care of by the government and they have gone and uh, trained. So these are the avenues you can try. Uh, take a loan, self-fund it, pay it yourself later uh, because the opportunities are there. And also, Indian government has realized that we need about 2,000 pilots a year and we are producing less than 400 uh, uh, pilots a year which means, like I said, the asking rate is one is to six, one is to seven. So a lot of pilots had to go abroad, which is fairly expensive and also travel. Now, due to COVID, travel restrictions are severe. You will not be able to go to certain countries for next six months, eight months, one year, or depends on that because they have put us on uh, uh, either quarantine list or no flux. And a lot of uh, schools are also not operating and parents are also worried about sending to a foreign country, God knows what happens. Then once you train and come back, you have to go through a DGCA license conversion program where we have to pass minimum three DGCA exams and then type a certification if required. So four to five exams and RTR if you go to US, etc. And then you need to fly a certain number of hours and get a conversion done. Now this, depending on which flight school you come from, which flight school you join, and what is your current recency on your license? Can it take anywhere from three months to six months because DGC exams are conducted sometime late. Then the flying gets interrupted because some people's recency is expired, medical expired, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot more money to be spent after coming. So Indian government has now given a direction that they want majority of the flight training to happen within the country under Make in India, under Self-Aligned India, under Skill Development, Skill India. So that all those things should help those people who are, uh, uh, you know, looking for uh, funding as well as uh, uh, training within the country. Uh, Max, I hope I answered the question. Yeah, so uh, you answered it uh, really well because I think uh, uh, there will be a lot of people who, and please, anyone who is watching this webinar, if you're interested to become a pilot, you know, do um, send us a message, write in the comments below. Uh, we have a team in place which will answer each and every person. And uh, Asia Pacific Flight Training uh, have this program, have a number of different uh, options available to people who initially would have thought maybe that, okay, I need to pay, uh, I don't know what the Indian currency amount was that Hemant was saying before. Um, but you know, let's say sixty thousand dollars. That in India in itself, through the banking partners that, uh, or, or maybe even through government subsidies, that there are potential uh, sources of funds. So once again, if you're watching this webinar and you want to become a pilot, uh, you're from India and you're thinking about doing your pilot training in India, you know, please send us a message. Uh, you know, you have our email address. Please comment uh, below. Uh, and uh, we will certainly reach out to you and share more information with you. Um, I want to, uh, I, I saw another question pop up uh, uh, also on Facebook where we're live streaming this, uh, which is, there's a lot of people who are asking, what is the best uh, flight school? And uh, before I hand it over to you, um, I, I would just say what kind of our belief is at Aviation Fly. Um, we believe that the best flight school for an individual is dependent on what that person is kind of looking for, what his goals are, what his current you know, circumstances are. Can they do full-time training? Can they only do part-time training? Um, so the best is really dependent on each and every individual person. 
but then also on a number of different factors, uh, such as safety and so on, which I'll now hand over to Hemant just to uh, kind of talk a bit more about uh, certain things to look for um, when, uh, uh, when picking a flight school. And then following that, I know there's been a number of questions. So after this, we'll also answer all of the questions in regards to maximum age and, uh, uh, and uh, if you need to wear glasses. Uh, but for now, Hemant, what is your recommendation in terms of how should an aspiring pilot uh, pick a flight school? Uh, thanks, Ma uh, Mike. And yes, it is a very important criteria because most people who come from, uh, to flight training might not necessarily have uh, people in aviation and that too in flight training within their family circles or friend circles to advise them correctly. And unlike picking a college or a school, it's not that easy because it's much more technical. So people tend to go on the internet. I have seen a lot of videos floating on the YouTube, on all the social media, various guys in pilots uniform saying that, you know, this is the best, that is the best, this is the way to do, that's the way to do. Well, it's all one individual person's opinion. Okay, it depends. Maybe they'll have followers and they are talking because they've been through one flight school. Their experience is limited to that flight school or whoever their friends have done. It's not a cross section of the society and it is definitely not a scientific survey done. It is a person's opinion. And a lot of youngsters I see are being misguided by some of these people saying, oh, this, this is better, that is better. You should go with an objective review of what is a good flight school. First and foremost, what is most important in a flight school? It should be safe. You should go back home. You should have a long and fruitful career by God's grace because your parents are sending there for you to be a successful professional. And your safety, life and limb safety is the most important. That is undisputedly number one, that how many accident and incident free hours has that flight school recorded? And fortunately in the last one year, we have seen over four fatal accidents, one which is day before yesterday, okay, where over seven people have died. Now this criteria is above all other criteria. So we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to ensure that this happens. And sometimes this might delay your training because you know certain institute might take much more care and do not release the aircraft unless everything is pick and span. And some of them might release it early. Trust me, you can be a pilot till the age of 65, provided you take care of your health. So a few months here or there is not going to make a difference, you know, in your overall scheme of things. You would rather do it safely and uh, uh, with the, a lot of security. So this is very easy to find out. Either it should be published on their website or you can ask them that how many accident oblique incidents did they have or even DGCA on RTI you can ask that okay what is the accident incident ratio uh, of a, a particular flight school or uh, uh, the general area that is the most important safety number two you're safe you become a pilot what do you want to be you want to be hired you want to join now to touch on the first one uh, uh, you know my colleagues will not pardon me if I don't mention this that by God's grace, last eight to nine years and our team's hard work, we have over 17,000 hours of accident and incident free flying, which means we have not had any reportable incident to DGCA where any digression has happened. And by God's grace, we have not had any accident at all. So that is one of our proudest achievement than anything else in the entire organization, not profit, not a number of students, not anything else, but it is the accident and incident free flying hours. So since inception, we have zero incidents or accidents. Uh, that is what we are most proud of. After you're safe and you become a pilot, what do you want to be? You want to be hired. You want to be working in an airline or any aviation organization uh, and, you know, uh, 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 flying as a pilot. That is the second most criteria for picking a flight school. So when you go and ask them that where their, uh, what is their percentage selection, uh, you will come to know uh, that if X number have already passed out of this school, there is no reason why I will not be uh, selected. In that one, again, that is our second most uh, proud achievement uh, of Asia Pacific flight training is we have 97. 
placement since inception. And trust me, the balance two, two and a half percent is some people have moved abroad or changed jobs or they got married and all that stuff. That is on their own. So practically it is 100 percent. And all eight airlines in the country, Indigo, SpiceJet, Vistara, Air India, AirAsia, Go Air, TrueJet, Blue Dart, even our own uh, 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 flight training academy and some other flight training academies and even some foreign airlines, our cadets are flying in all of them. Matter of fact, we were the first school back in 2015-16, which was selected by a major airline for doing cadet pilot conversion training. And we signed up with two foreign FTOs to do that. After that, we have had campus interviews of Vistara. And as our understanding goes, that's the only school where they came and did a campus interview and hired uh, our cadets at zero cost. You know, some of these foreign cadet tra pilot training program can cost you up to 1.2 crores. And here at one third of that cost, without even having to travel to the airline for the interview, they came to our office, Vistara did an in-house campus interview, then they did an in-house psychometric assessment and hired some of our pilots. Those are some of our proudest moments. Three major airlines have come and done over two day audit of our organization, our aeroplanes, our instructors, and given us contract. Matter of fact, there are certain contracts under negotiation currently. And let me also tell you that we have one of the best uh, instructors and one of the best training team and one of the best maintenance instruction ground instruction team in the country we are known to have the most experience and one of the highest paid teams in the country because we feel that you know for quality you need to pay money and that is and our engineers and our pilots are at par or paid even better than the airlines that is the reason we have people staying here for six years, seven years, eight years. Otherwise, we have a lot of schools where, you know, pilots and uh, instructors and engineers, they join and leave, join and leave, uh, you know, because they join only to get some experience and then they leave and, you know, they find a little better uh, uh, pay packet somewhere on airline. Not a single one of our flight training uh, 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 team has uh, ever uh, gone and joined another flight training organization. We have had people joining from others, but... So that tells you the placement is the most important. And these airlines, if they have chosen us, and three international flight training organizers have chosen us, Honeywell, which is a major aerospace company, have chosen us to do their pilot training for their aviation, uh, avionics engineers, uh, advanced PPL of ATRs. Even Civil Aviation Authority of Nepal has selected us for uh, ATPL theory training. So these are certificates from others. We don't need to talk about us. If these organizations have chosen us, uh, Mary, you can go back to uh, a few slides where uh, the, uh, these things are mentioned. Yeah, one more, please. Yeah, that's the one. So these are the airlines and of course, yeah, no, 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 stay there. Next, yes, that's it. So these are the airlines which I've heard from us and I told you uh, who had done a campus interview and then uh, some of the companies which are probably not mentioned here, like I said, Honeywell, Civil Aviation Authority of Nepal, so on and so forth. These are the people who have engaged us in hiring. Now that is as far as uh, uh, placement is concerned. The third question, the third uh, point of selection is the type and age of aircraft. Now, like anything else, you know, safety comes also from the type of aircraft. Now, there are some aircraft, you might have heard of Cessna 152s. Cessna 152, which is in a fairly large number in the country, over 30-40% uh, of the aircraft are Cessna 152s. And the very good aircraft, no doubt, very versatile, very sturdy and very old. Okay, the last Cessna 152 was manufactured in 1985. I think... By 1985, most of your parents were not born. Forget about you guys. So you don't want to fly in an aeroplane which is older than your dad. Trust me. Okay. If you can help it. And others are, you know, uh, DGCA does not allow more than 20-year-old aircraft to be imported. But majority of the aircrafts are more than 20 years old. So that is a major criteria that how young is a fleet, how modern it is. And then also are they glass cockpit. Glass cockpit, for those ones who don't know, is a digital cockpit where all your, uh, you know, uh, dials and uh, radars and uh, speed indicator, uh, uh, everything, 
uh, artificial horizon, etc., are uh, computerized. It's uh, we, uh, you know, you call what is that? The Garmin G1000 uh, uh, glass cockpit, and uh, most of these old aircraft, like the Cessna 152, are all analog. Analog means around dial. These are the old, uh, you know, like in the old Ambassador, you see the needle moving up and down. That type of a thing. That gives you only limited uh, 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 horizon because it was manufactured before 1980. So obviously, at that time, this technology did not exist. So a glass cockpit aircraft, which is more modern, which is younger fleet, is much more safer and you learn much better. And then there is something called as FedEx, which is a full authorized uh, you know, engine control system, which is a very safety device, which does not allow the aeroplane to start in case there is a fault in any of the mechanisms. Now this again is there in all the modern aircraft, uh, jet aircraft, but that's not there in the older aeroplanes. So that's one focus area where we have said, I told you majority of the aircraft are, you know, 30 plus years old and some of them are 20 plus years old. Uh, again, our fleet, our teenagers, we are, you know, in the around 12 to 13 year category, which is even younger than what DGC allows. And it's been with us for about seven, eight years. So when we got it, they were barely two year old, three year old planes. So they were, uh, they are top class condition. And I told in the beginning that our aeroplanes are, uh, you know, uh, carbon fiber body. If you Mary, go to these slides, a uh, few slides back, uh, there is a photograph of the uh, airplanes, uh, which is DA40 and 42. Yes, uh, 40 is a single engine, 42 is the multi engine, though this picture is of Austro engines, but we are flying ATF engines, which are tillered continental diesel engines. Important thing, like I said, is that it is made up of carbon fiber uh, composite airframe, which makes it very light and very fuel efficient. These are fully glass cockpit fitted with FedEx and uh, 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 very young relatively uh, uh, fleet. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, safety and uh, uh, security of the aircraft is well taken care of if your airplane is uh, uh, from a good manufacturer and it, uh, it, 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 it flies well. So these are time tested. And by the way, Diamond is one of the most expensive aircrafts in the market. And before COVID, Diamond had a lead time of 12 to 18 months to purchase an aircraft. Okay. So that tells you the demand of the aeroplanes and that tells you the quality of the aeroplane. So that is point number three. We can go back to that slide. That type of aircraft, age of aircraft and the avionics is very uh, critical. That is the third one. And the fourth, and again, very important is cadet to instructor ratio. Now that is, if you go to some schools, you know, my uh, wife once went to a school to teach as a guest lecturer and she realized, a guest teacher, sorry, and she realized in that classroom, there were 45 to 50 students, you know, small kids. How can a teacher teach 45 to 50 students alone uh, in a classroom? Most mothers will tell you teaching one kid or fathers, though totally useless, uh, tried it too. Okay, uh, teaching one kid is a problem and then you start throwing things. 40 of them, I mean, forget it. Now, DGCA mandates that the carrot to instructor ratio should be one is to one is to 10, which means one aircraft, uh, 10, uh, one aircraft, one instructor, 10 students. Okay, so one is to 10 is the ratio that DGCA allows. Unfortunately, majority of the schools in the country have a ratio of one is to 20, one is to 30. I know of flight training schools with four or five aeroplanes. And sometimes the number of aeroplanes declared is not the same as the ones which are flying. They might have six or seven aeroplanes, only four or five are serviceable. Okay. So you take the serviceable aircraft to the total number of carriages. They are 120, 130, 160 carriages in one on flight schools. So if you're having four, five, six aeroplanes, you're talking a ratio of one is to 30, one is to 25. Now one is to 25 is difficult to manage in a, you know, a nursery class or a primary class, cadet training, we just told you it's a one-on-one -on -one training. How much time will the instructor spend with the cadet if he's got 25 people to teach at a time? And what time will your flying come? You'll be waiting in a queue. And that leads to something which is quite unfortunate and prevalent in the Indian market, which some of you have done the research would have known what is called as overlogging. 
you fly one hour they will write one hour 30 minutes one hour 40 minutes in the log book it started off from 40 minutes to put it 50 minutes or 55 now they are so blatant you fly one hour and they put one and a half or two hours i've had a carrier who came and said he flew only 80 hours and he was given a license for 200 hours that's very unfortunate there are many unscrupulous schools out there who are doing this it's like driving license you know they go and they say don't worry we'll get you the driving license you don't need to come for training now this is flight training. I told you till the age of 65, you have to fly. You want your family, your loved ones, your fathers, mothers, your husbands, wives, your boyfriends, girlfriends for you to come back home and enjoy that life and not risk it by, you know, uh, doing this uh, uh, training too early or saving few lakh rupees and risking not only yours, but your passengers lives as well. So carrot to instructor ratio is very critical. One is to 10 is a DGCTA mandate. Very simply ask the people how many school students are there in the school. Divide it by the number of aeroplanes and the instructor, you will get this answer. One is to 10 is the ratio. And we are glad to report that we are the lowest instructor to carry to aircraft ratio in the country. We have 1.6, 1 is to 6.5 ratio. We are actually minus four. We can take four more carriages per instructor, which we will take slowly. We have never ever taken the full complement despite having a waiting list of over one year because we believe uh, that training quality is more important than quantity. That directly relates to point number two that we have 97% placements and we have eight or nine airlines of which three or four of them have come to our campus to hire our people. So carry to instructor ratio leads not only to quality of training, but also this risk of overlogging and, you know, fake training. I, I, we know of cases where people have not done night checks and their night checks have been recorded in the logbook saying done. So it's not the money. It's not the number of students. It's not the look and feel of the organization. It is these four criteria which are most important. And among the fourth is also the experience of the instructors. Okay, now if you have five instructors, but each of them have 200, 300 hours of flying, which is just 100 hours more than your CPL, it's like going to Harvard or to IIM or IIT, and you are 21 year old and your professor is 22 years old. What he or she is going to teach you? They hardly have any experience. They just passed their exams recently. So our uh, average uh, uh, instructor uh, hours per instructor is over 3,000 hours. 3,000 hours is our average instructor instructional hours. And with our senior most ones touching 6,500 to 5,500 hours. So this, folks, is the criteria for choosing a flight school. Rest all is fluff. Never mind the YouTube videos. Never mind the, uh, you know, all the famous YouTubers. This is the uh, criteria. Okay. Well, thank you, Hemen, for really uh, sharing this um, with everyone today. So we also want to uh, once again confirm that whenever, if you're an aspiring pilot watching this webinar later, we're going to upload it on YouTube and Facebook. Whenever you pick a flight school, always look at the different criteria. Speak to them. You can ask them as many questions as possible. Um, and, you know, because this is a big life decision. Uh, if, for example, some of the data is not available from the school, you can check with the Civil Aviation Authority, or you can also uh, check online. But especially when you look online, uh, there's always a lot of opinions from different people. So it's really good to request information directly from the school and get, uh, get answers to it. Um, I, I quickly want to go to the question and answers because I know it's already been two, uh, more than two hours that we've uh, been doing this webinar, if I'm not mistaken, or almost two hours that we've been doing this webinar. Uh, so there's a couple of questions here which uh, Hemant and I will answer. Um, let's start off with the, one of the questions which has been kind of answered already is, is maths and physics compulsory for pilot training? Uh, both outside of India and inside of India. And uh, the question which has already been uh, partially answered is uh, certain knowledge of math and physics is required uh, in order to get your commercial pilot license uh, and to become a pilot. Um, if you do not have that set level, that set requirement yet of 
uh, math and physics, you can always speak to Asia Pacific Flight Training or to us uh, to kind of find out what you need to learn uh, to study this in advance uh, of, of, you know, uh, starting your pilot training. So uh, I know someone has uh, commented earlier that uh, someone uh, uh, has commented earlier, I mean, this is just uh, for us to, this was interesting for me to hear, but I've seen this question a lot. Um, uh, I'm weak in maths uh, uh, after hearing that all aircraft jobs and engineering need maths. What can I uh, do? Can you please explain uh, more? Because, you know, there's a lot of people who are worried that, you know, they say they're not that great at maths. Um, it is really not something to worry about. You know, at the end of the day, pilot schools, flight schools are there, they're trainers, they're educators. So for example, him and if, if there's anyone who's not great at math, how does Asia Pacific flight training kind of support them uh, in, in you know, understanding the subjects that they need to do? All right. Uh, now, there is a certain level of uh, 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 proficiency which is required in the subject simply because when you fly an aeroplane, these things automatically come into play, the physics and the little calculation, whether it's fuel calculation, weight and balance, you know, speed and all that stuff. Now, this is not very high level maths. This is average level maths, school level maths. Now, if somebody feels that they are weak in maths, you can take, a, a, you know, side course in India. There are a lot of tutors which can do online as well as offline. As far as training in the academy is concerned, when we do the subjects, we try to take all the students along with us. Okay. It is not that, you know, we want some toppers and some people to drop out. Then you will not have 97% placement. Then you'll have only 40, 50% of top guys place. Rest of them, uh, you know, working as a, a waiter somewhere. Huh? Not to say that waiters is not a good job. Okay. But uh, we uh, uh, do a pre-screening. And if we feel that some people require some additional training, we recommend that we give them home exercises to do. And in the school, uh, we are more than generous. We have had cases where people have passed out, gone, given airline exam. At that time, they wanted some help or they are flying in an airline and they wanted to do some internal exam, ATPL theory exam. They would come back to our instructors and we will be more than happy to teach them because at the end of the day, they are our students. It's not that only when they are training here, we help them. So we have a very well qualified uh, 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 team of instructors who are uh, ex Air Force, or uh, they are, you know, aeronautical engineers, masters, uh, 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 both bachelor and masters, uh, with the teaching experience in universities and other schools. So, uh, we teach them uh, these subjects from a passing point of view and also knowledge point of view. And again, there are a lot of uh, those training institutes which are held in Delhi and some other place where they just teach you how to pass the exam, which is fine. But trust me. A lot of those people are not able to get employed because the airline will not just look at your results. They will ask you a question. They will ask you to do uh, calculations and do uh, 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 come up with answers on the spot. And there is newspaper reports that X thousand pilots are unemployed in India. Please understand, these pilots are not unemployed. Some of them are unemployable. There's a difference between unemployed and unemployable because you're taken shortcuts, you are overlocked the hours, you are passed uh, exams of DGCA by going to these chop shops uh, who teaches like, you know, 50, 60, 100 students at a time, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, you pass the exam. But when you go to an airline interview, you flunk it because they will not take you based on your results. They will take you based on the interview results. So we keep that in mind and students who are weak in this, we help them by doing some extra classes, telling them to do certain exercises or even recommending, uh, you know, classes after hours to pass. But uh, so far in our last eight, nine hours, we never had any problem. Uh, all our students have passed. So not a, not an issue there. Okay. And, and uh, um, this is also, I just want to once again confirm that if you're weak at mass or physics, do not worry. At the end of the day, pilot training organizations, they're educators, they're trainers, you know, uh, they, um, the, the whole motto of, of schools is to educate and to train and uh, will assist anyone who's weak in math and physics. Another question which you briefly touched upon is, is there any interview to get admission into a pilot school? Um, 
I don't know about other schools, uh, but any decent flying school would do an interview uh, to, like I said, to assess the knowledge level of the cadet and yeah. also advise them like basic physics and maths uh, to understand numbers. I mean, if, the, if the, the, some people cannot even do additions and multiplication, they're going to struggle. And there is no point falsely telling them, okay, come over, we'll teach you. And then they are struggle and they're not able to, this is not a, a degree with just a paper. You need to take an aeroplane up in the air. In 14 to 15 hours, we will be trusting a multi crore aircraft in your hand where you'll accelerate at over 200 kilometers an hour and fly that aeroplane or a busy city like Hyderabad. That requires skill. And for that required skill, there are certain basic minimum requirements. So we will interview a pilot, uh, sorry, a cadet to assess he or she has that basic knowledge, not very complex, like I said, basic knowledge. In case they do not have, and if they are borderline, we say, okay, we will train them. We will take them next step. If they are below the borderline, we will ask them to do some training and come back because these skills are masterable. You know, it's not uh, untouchable. So not not to worry okay and I have another one which is also uh, before joining the training a question which has been asked is eyesight parameters so for one of the questions which we see all the time and which we've created actually a video uh, for and uploaded on YouTube is can one become a pilot wearing glasses yeah 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 pilots can wear glasses not a problem it's a corrected vision Six uh, by six. Six by six is. Uh, what? Huh? Six by six D. Yeah. Uh, six by six D. And uh, in case they want uh, more detail based on individuals, what their uh, uh, eyesights are, they can write to us and we'll explain to them. And uh, yes, you can wear uh, spectacles and fly an aeroplane, no problem. Or you can have a, a what do you call this, contact lenses and all. Uh, you just need to have clear vision and also color blindness, etc. is checked, which will be checked in your class two medical. So in case you have doubts, you can go and do a class two medical. Uh, it'll cost you just a couple of thousand rupees and your mind is put to rest. There's nothing to worry. Yeah, okay, fantastic. And uh, one of the questions was also before the start of training is we've had two people ask, is there a maximum age limit to start your pilot training? Yeah, 65. Okay, okay. <laughs> Just kidding. No, no, no. Up to the age of 65, you can fly. There is absolutely no maximum age limit. Minimum age limit is there. You should be 18 at the time of submission of license or 16 when you start PPL, 17 when you start CPL. Okay. So by the time you submit the license or 16 or 17, you start, uh, you should have passed your 12th exam and you should have uh, uh, attain the age of 18 when you submit your license uh, to DGCA. Uh, higher side, some airlines take, uh, you know, slowly the age uh, uh, limit is improving. At one time it was below 30, then it became 32, now it's 35. Because as more and more pilots are required, the companies are relaxing the age limit. At one time, Indian pilots used to retire at 60. Now the government has made it 65 because mm -hmm. they don't need more pilots. So, and it's really not a criteria. Uh, we have had cases of doctors. There was a lady who was a doctor uh, I met and apparently uh, she was dating, her fiance was a pilot and she felt that that is more interesting than being a doctor. She changed from doctor to become a pilot and she was 35, 36 by the time she did that. No problem, she's flying happily. We have had uh, chartered accountants come here. We have had uh, tons of uh, B.Tech uh, engineers who come and join. So there is no specific age limit uh, as per the government. Uh, airlines normally accept. And by the way, it's not just the airline. There are three, three places where you can go to get job as a pilot One in the, in the private field. One is an airline, of course. Second is general aviation. Like I said, this private jets, charter planes, all that stuff. A lot of companies fly private jets and they're much, much more sophisticated than the airline. Okay. And then flight training organizations. I said, we already have 200, uh, close to 180. And the required demand for India is supposed to be another 200, believe it or not, 200 in the next five to six years. So there are a lot of jobs out there, nothing to worry about. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, we got another question, which is, if someone wants to join now, 
is it the theory part that will be taught now uh, for like, let's say six months to a year, or does a kind of a combined training start now so that it is theory and flight training, which would start now. So can you just give a bit more of an overview? Let's say someone would join Asia Pacific flight training in 2020, what kind of the core structure would look like? Yeah, the theory uh, requirement for a full commercial pilot license, uh, CPL, MEIR, as you call it, CPL, commercial pilot license, multi-engine instrument rated, there's about uh, 350 to 400 hours of classroom studies, which is mandatory on uh, subjects such as air regulation, navigation, metrology, technical, general, technical, specific, etc. That takes approximately three to four months or more, uh, depending on the speed of the, uh, for a person to honestly pass it and have knowledge. Um, now, normally when any cadet joints they will first go through this training for the first two to three months as they start gaining understanding and they have to pass what is called as an SPL exam uh, student pilot license which is held internally by a team of RCFIs and accountable managers etc once they pass that they get a student pilot license and meanwhile their uh, paperwork and DGC uh, sorry the uh, uh, pass etc is made they can start flying as well simultaneously so in a total course of 18 months the first three to four months are for ground training and then rest uh, towards the end of that they will start flying and then the rest of the time is for flying that's how it starts Fantastic. Um, we've got a couple of uh, people who are really interested in uh, kind of the financing of scholarship slash uh, state subsidies. So if you just uh, either go to uh, the Asia Pacific Fly Training website or send us a message at Aviation Fly or comment below um, or, you know, leave your email address here. We've made note of all the questions. We will get back to you with all the information uh, for Asia Pacific uh, flight training. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, if there are any other questions, I think Hans, uh, it would be great if you can type them in now. Otherwise, uh, we will uh, kind of wrap up here. Uh, so let's see, qualifications we've answered, eyesight we've answered, uh, maximum age limits we have answered, um, uh, skills India subsidies, uh, we will share with you the information. Uh, let's see, interview we've done. In which school does Hemenf, uh, in which school you teach Hemenf? So we got that question as well, which is Asia Pacific uh, flight training based in Hyderabad. Uh, we got a new question here from Neti. I wanted to know if we can complete our DGCA exams by ourselves and then join a flight training organizations to complete the flight training and gain flying hours? Well, uh, the short answer to that is you cannot teach yourself how to uh, 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 fly an aeroplane and be safe in the sky, however uh, brilliant you are. That's like asking, can I self-study to become a doctor and then start testing on patients? Uh, I think if you ask the patients just before operating that, you know, I did the home study, you know, so you'll see how many patients will get up and run from that operating table, even if they're under anesthesia. So it is like, uh, you know, imagine ma making an announcement in an airplane that I studied at home. This is not a, uh, a, you know, a light course, folks. We have instructors with experience up to 39 years in aviation, 18 years in aviation, 26 years in aviation and all put together they've all done over 20 to 30 thousand hours of flying ask yourself a question that this experience these instructors bring to the table with over 100 hours years of experience with 30 to 40 thousand hours of flying training can that experience be replaced by learning at home on youtube or on your dgca software uh, not DGC, there, there are a lot of softwares available saying that, you know, teach yourself at home and all that stuff. To do justice, again, I bring to the point, you want to be flying for the next 45 years. If you are going to invest in 45 years of your life, I suggest to learn it from the best teachers 
available in the country. And the best teachers are available at the best FTOs. You can revise at home, but it's not something that you can do self-study. And also there are a lot of schools who supposedly finish these courses in one year, one month, two months, and teach you how to pass. Well, if you want to pass in the exam, but fail in your aviation, that's the best way to go. But if you want to pass in both the exam as well as be a safe pilot for the next 45 years, come to a proper authorized DGC approved training school and use the experience of these people. Like I said, we have three or four instructors who are in this uh, in, uh, experience range of over, uh, you know, 20 to uh, 30 years, you know, uh, up to 40 years, one of them. Uh, and uh, even the youngest one has got over 15 years of uh, aviation experience and uh, degrees such as, uh, uh, you know, uh, aeronautical engineer, masters, bachelors, uh, Air Force pilots, Navy pilots. These are our uh, instructors. So you best make use of that. Okay, thank you, Hamid. Uh, we've got the last final questions. Uh, especially quite a few also uh, from Facebook. Uh, one question which has come up is, does Emirates hire pilots from uh, Asia Pacific flight training? We have had some pilots go from here who have joined uh, uh, Emirates and who are flying in Emirates, mm -hmm. uh, at least pre-COVID they were, but they have not come here for any direct uh, campus recruitment, no. Okay. But we have had our pilots go uh, and get selected in uh, uh, Emirates and flying there, both the instructors and the students. And uh, uh, another question, for example, from Asna, which is if there is any average marks to get admission. So is there like an admissions test? Ah, yes, we do conduct an internal admission test. Okay. Uh, like I said, we do an interview and a test just to assess the knowledge level. Uh, it depends. Uh, there is no hard and fast rule. Obviously, the higher you get, the better it is. In case some people who might have done borderline, but in the interview, if they convince us that they know the subject, we take them. Uh, as far as your school marks are concerned, ideally, one looks at about at least 60% plus. But even if we have had very good cadets who have done very well in exam and they have got into airlines, who got less than 60% too, which is why we do that interview to personally assess their assessment and their aptitude to fly. Fantastic. And uh, we, got a, we got another question uh, actually through Facebook, which is uh, someone has been asking, what about the type rating? So does Asia Pacific flight training also offer type rating or kind of how do you address that aspect, which kind of uh, pilots need before they join an airline? Now, we do not directly offer type training because it requires a different license and a different type of simulator. But we have an association with the, one of the best flight training, uh, the uh, ATO, aviation training organization, with multiple simulators. So uh, our cadets who require type training, we facilitate them through that at a, a concessional rate. Fantastic, fantastic. And uh, okay, let's just go for one final question here, uh, which is, um, uh, let me just find it again. Uh, where was it? Uh, which is essentially, as someone said, they're in 10th grade now. Um, when should they start kind of the process of, um, you know, uh, starting to talk to uh, a flight training organization, to a pilot school about uh, kind of their admission and uh, about starting their training. So when, even though that they're in 10th uh, grade now, when do you recommend for them to, uh, you know, speak with a pilot training organization? Uh, interesting. Only yesterday we had a 10th standard uh, student, uh, 15 years old for God's sake, got in touch with us saying that he wants to be one of the youngest pilots in the country and the world. And uh, as per rules, at the age of 16, you can start training for private pilot license. You can give the DGC exam at the age of, uh, sorry, DGC medical examination at the age of 16. And you can finish your PPL by seven. Uh, you can start your CPL training by 17 and you can be a CPL by 18. So, yep, at the age of 16 or 10, you can start talking, you can understand, you can study on the side, you know, the, all these subjects that I talked about, metrology, air navigation, 
uh, a technical general, technical specific, uh, air regulation, you know, on the side. Don't neglect your studies, but on the side, you know, keep in touch with, you know, what's going on with the aeroplanes and all. And when you come of age and when you finally pass your 12th, you go full-fledged into commercial pilot training. So you're that much ahead. Okay. Um, well, I think we'll leave it at that. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, please do not hesitate uh, to write to us. Uh, you can visit the Asia Pacific uh, uh, Flight Training Academy website. Uh, you can visit aviationfly.com. Um, we will uh, share with you all the information that you may you might require. We will answer any questions that uh, you have. Uh, we've also recorded this webinar, uh, so we will be uploading this both on YouTube and on Facebook because I know there's a lot of people who have registered for this webinar uh, but then could not uh, join for this. Uh, if once again, if you have any questions still while watching this webinar, please drop them down below in the comments. Uh, other than that, uh, thank you uh, very much, everyone. I saw on Facebook that uh, it has reached approximately 1,597 people, uh, which is really wow. fantastic. Uh, so um, thank you, everyone, and um, stay safe. And if you are a pilot, just to summarize what Hemant and I have been saying, uh, the industry is going through an extremely difficult time, most probably the most difficult time uh, that, has ever, uh, that it has ever gone through in the history of this industry. But if you are really uh, passionate and want to become a pilot, uh, really do consider about why right now could be an ideal time uh, because by the time you actually get your license and you can apply for a job and have one of the best jobs in the world uh, in terms of the view that you're going to get, um, then do consider it uh, now and you know do reach out to us and we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Hemant, for your time today. And um, yeah, we look forward to hearing more about Asia Pacific flight training in the future. Sure thing. Thank you very much, uh, Max. Pleasure. And thanks to Mary and uh, Anna, Trisha. Trisha. Um, thanks a lot. Perfect. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, yeah, have a nice day.